Essentially it. Okay, Let, let's, let's, let's begin now. So is hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Olga Ramos and I'm the Director of Admissions. Um, where for the co-host, if, if I'm missing anyone in the um, waiting room, please let them in. I don't want yes, people waiting. Will. Thank you. Um, so we have a program for this evening. I emailed it to all of you, so I hope you have it, but um, I'll also read through it throughout the, throughout the evening. Um, we'll begin with our principal, Valerie Thompson. So I'll pass it on to you. Thanks so much, Olga. Um, so I'm Val Thompson. I'm the founding principal of Bard High School Early College Queens. We began our school in 2008. Um, the first public high school early college in the US was Bard High School Early College, which is now in Manhattan. It started in Brooklyn. That opened in 2001. And it was um, a school meant for students who are serious learners, who really enjoy learning, who want to um, explore their ideas and have a place to do that where um, they're free to do that. So there's freedom and exploration and thinking um, at the Bards. And it was a, a way to take students seriously who are younger as thinkers. So when you're 13, 14, 15, 16, you're thought of as somebody with ideas that you know you want to be able to articulate and to share with others and to hear other people's ideas um, and, and develop your own way of thinking. Um, and in 2006, it became clear that there weren't really enough seats at Bethick Manhattan to fill all the need in the city, that there were really more students out there who wanted that opportunity than we had available at one school. If we wanted to keep the school small and be able to, um, uh, thank you so much. My daughter just brought me tea. <laughs> um, and so if, if we wanted to be able to make room for additional people, we also thought about the location of the school. Um, and so um, we're, there's, Bard Manhattan is on the Lower East Side and we wanted another location that would be accessible to people where that one wasn't as accessible. And so um, Long Island City, which is where BSEC Queens is located, is a hub of subway stops and buses that come to our location. And so um, we hoped that it would be easier for some people to travel who are looking for, for that kind of an education. And um, when we think about Bard um, as a place to think. That's a motto for Bard, a place to think. Um, there's a Norman McLean quote from A River Runs Through It that I wanna share with you all, because I think it helps get a depiction of the kind of thinking that happens at Bard. We do a lot of writing um, to develop our thinking. And um, Norman McLean says, all there is to thinking is seeing something that was noticeable, which makes you see something, which makes you see something you weren't noticing, which makes you see something that isn't even visible. And I think that happens for all of us through our writing, that when we start to think about something that we see, we write a bit about it, and then we notice something that we weren't even noticing before, and then we share ideas and think about it and hear from others and something that wasn't even visible at all comes to take shape. And so that's part of the Bard experience. And this is a particular open house specific for our students who are thinking about the special ed program. And I brought that quote up because when we think about things that weren't even visible, um, and then have them develop. I think my own thinking at Bard has really developed over the past five years. When we started in 2008, um, we didn't have a special education program per se. We were always interested and open to having students come who had um, different learning styles and may have needed different supports in order to get to the same place. But it, there was sort of a, if you build it, they will come, but if they're not here, nobody's building anything early on and we missed out. You know, those first few years, 
we would say, well, yes, if somebody comes who has special needs, we would hire teachers and then we would have a program, but you can't hire teachers before you have somebody who would need those teachers. So there was a back and forth in the beginning. And I think for those first, uh, from 2008 to 2015, we really did miss out in some ways. Um, in 2016, we hired Jess Van Scoy, who on my screen is up on the right, but you'll see her on your screen too. And that was the first year where we started to develop our program. And some of the things that we were missing and didn't see when we weren't noticing were the breadth of contributions that can be made um, by having a, a diverse audience um, in terms of learning styles, and also the richness that comes from um, having needing by law to meet some of the requirements and needs of students, um, we see that that makes for a much richer education for all students. And so the kinds of things that happen in our classrooms in terms of ways of approaching teaching um, is enriched as well. And I think we'll hear some of that through the question and answer. And also Lori Ween will touch on some of the things that we've shifted and done um, through the years that make that a better place for all learners. Um, and then I just, Somebody asked um, in the questions that were submitted in advance, and I wanted to just say this before I give up my introduction, um, was, you know, do you have a theater program? It was just something about theater at BSEC and how are students with um, disabilities invited to participate in the theater program? And I, I asked our theater teacher what he, what he wanted to say about that. And so he, this is a quote from him. I think the most important thing about theater is that it naturally engages all types of learners, auditory and musical learners, visual and spatial learners, verbal learners, physical or kinesthetic learners, social, interpersonal learners, et cetera. This allows students who tend to struggle with one kind of learning, the ability to engage with material in a way that feels more natural to them. And then, he told a story about um, like imagine somebody approaching a complex text like Romeo and Juliet. And in that text, if you're if reading is something you struggle with, if reading comprehension might be something you struggle with, but you're a real kinesthetic learner and could step into the shoes of a character and um, bring a challenge, challenging text like Romeo and Juliet um, into it to life for you as a kinesthetic learner, you found a way as um, somebody with reading comprehensive challenges to really understand that text in a different way. But also as somebody who's in that classroom, I think you bring to that text another reading and another lens that all the general education students in that classroom benefit from as well, who might be looking at it as a strictly from a literary point of view. And so I thought that that was a good introduction to, um, in, in answer to a specific question, the ways that we are pleased to see the growth in our program over the last five years. So thank you, Olga. Thank you, Val. Um, so up next is Lori Ween. Hi. Hi, everyone. So, um, I have arrived at BSEC Queens. I started last year and I came by way of BSEC Manhattan and BSEC Newark. So this is my third BSEC building. Um, and, you know, my, my student Olga Carmona, who's now Olga Ramos, she was one of my first students at, at BSEC Manhattan. Um, so I deeply believe in this program and how important it is to be able to do college work um, in 11th grade when you're sort of ready to, to dive in. And so um, as I made my way through different, um, different campuses, um, what drew me to Queens was this amazing opportunity to really develop our special needs program and really develop an environment that invites students who, who may process differently, who may think differently, who may need different support. So I am super excited to be here. I've been um, doing a lot of work with the, the faculty and the team, which is phenomenal. Um, the teachers are fantastic. Um, the, you know, the, the providers are amazing. And it's been really inspiring to see how they all work together to figure out 
individually what's best for students, right? To really listen to the needs and really figure out how as a community we can, we can do what we need to do for students. So it's been really rewarding. Um, one thing I wanted to just touch on for, for a very quick minute, because I'm sure it's much more interesting to hear from, from the students and from parents and from, um, from those folks who've had this experience. But one of the things I'm really most proud of um, since I arrived at Pisa Queens is our new college tiered program. So we really struggled for, and all of the BSEX have struggled, all the three that I that I've been at have struggled with. What do you do when you when students graduate, you know, move into the college program, right? Finish 10th grade, go into 11th grade, which really is year one, right? We don't have an 11th grade, we have year one. When they get into the year one program, how do you continue to give students the supports that they need, um, but also allow them to experience what it's like to be in college classes and to really engage with their peers um, in a meaningful way. So we've been working really hard to, to build this tiered program in the, in the college level where there are three tiers. The first tier is you're independent, one teacher, you can choose whatever classes you want. You are considered in the gen ed program for that course. Tier two, meaning you have two teachers in the room, but you're doing the college work. You're just getting the supports that you need to be in that class. And then tier three, where you're in the college class, but we're able to modify the work so that you're able to be there, have the discussions, but also get the supports and modifications that you need. So we've been working through that program and it's something that we're gonna continue to, to make stronger and stronger as we go and learn more about how students respond to the tiered programs. Um, but it's one of the things that we're doing to, um, to really strengthen. And I love what Val was saying, I think, Anytime you have students in a classroom that think differently, it brings such an amazing um, dynamic ideas that other people might not have thought of. Um, and, you know, I also am a parent of a special needs child and I feel like I wanna build the kind of school that I would be really excited for my daughter to be able to go to. So that's, that's sort of, what goes on where I am. I'm, you know, I'm happy to talk to people if they have more questions, but that's, that's my role here um, at BSEC Queens. So. Thank you, Lori. Um, so the next part of um, the program is uh, admissions. And uh, when I schedule these events, uh, thinking about the dates back in September, I, I thought that we would have information from the Department of Education on how to proceed. Um, I don't have that information yet. I don't know when it's coming, but I will let you know um, how we've done admissions in the past and maybe share what I've proposed this year. Um, so in the past, we've had uh, an, an assessment and it was a two part assessment. It was a writing part that our faculty come up with. So there's a prompt and students respond to it. They come into the building. Um, they sit for it. It's an hour and a half. Um, and the other part would be kind of a multiple choice math assessment. Um, for students um, who are coming in with testing accommodations, we provide those um, no matter what they are. If students need an exam in Braille, we have it. If students need a scribe, if students need extended time, um, all of those we're able to provide. Um, and we have special testing dates um, for students. So that way um, they're in smaller uh, classrooms um, and get more individual help and attention. Um, the most important part of our assessment though is the interview. So students come in and they usually do this uh, writing assessment and this math, and then um, we invite them for an interview. And the past two years, um, we actually invited all of our students who are a special education um, because we really felt like, you know, there's only so much you can show on a test. Um, and if, especially if it's, if you, not are not able to kind of put everything down on paper. We want to speak to you and talk to you about the assessment. So it's one on one. Um, I do a lot of them, but um, so does all the faculty uh, for the most part on this call. Um, 
so that's the that carries the most weight in our admissions process. Um, in the past, we've asked for students to submit a report card, and we um, talk through the report card. We we talk about their their high grades and their low grades. Um, we really want to get a holistic sense of of the student. It's also a great opportunity for students to learn about Bard at that time. Um, so students come in with a lot of questions sometimes. Sometimes they come with no questions and that's okay. Um, but it's a really nice time. It's about a 15 minute interview uh, where we can just talk about why you wanna to come to Bard um, and things like that. This year, um, you know, we're all remote now. Um, so that makes it really difficult. Um, we did propose a modified assessment to the Department of Ed in October. Um, which included um, a writing component, um, not a computational math assessment, um, but there was a, a, a math part to it, a math STEM part to it. Um, the Department of Ed told us to wait and not to begin the admissions process um, until we receive further guidance. Um, and I think right now they're debating on, well, how to screen schools um, how are they going to accept students, you know, during, during these times. So um, I don't know what that means for us moving forward. You know, we have an assessment um, that's almost finalized that um, we proposed. Uh, again, it, there will be an interview that's really important for us. Um, and, you know, on our end, we're trying to figure out how do we conduct those interviews? We can do them on the computer, we can do them on the phone, um, things like that. It, there won't be any um, in-person events though. So uh, we also realize that, you know, there's some students in New York City that don't even have a device yet. Um, so those are real things that we're thinking about almost every day with, um, with the administration, with faculty, with parents, with current students. We have these conversations every day. Um, as soon as I, get more information from the Department of Ed, I will pass it along right away. Um, usually our process begins September 1st. And by this time, we would be, you know, interviewing students back to back um, in December and interviews wrap up in January. It looks now that the admissions process is going to begin sometime in January um, and then go through February, March. April maybe. Um, the deadline will be pushed back. Um, the, the messages that I've been getting from the Department of Ed is that an announcement will be made uh, later in the fall. And I've tried to read into that. Well, what do you mean? Do you mean December? Do you mean early winter? I don't know. So, but I, so I really, I really don't know. Um, and my last communication was right before Thanksgiving. Um, with Sarah Kleinhandler, who's the director of enrollment. So um, there really isn't any information. Screen schools really don't have information. Um, but that's why we put up an interest form on our website. So if you've been on our website, you can just make sure that you complete that interest form. Any information um, I get from the DOE will send you an update. We'll also send you updates on events that we'll add. I bet we'll add more um, events in January and February for all of you to join if you're interested. Um, but that that's, that's really all I have for admissions. I know a lot of you had questions that you submitted through the Google form on that. Um, and if there are more, um, more personalized questions, um, we can, you can ask them later or email me. Um, but I will make sure that I share whatever information I have with you as soon as I get it. Um, we do have, I just saw a message from our principal. We, we do have robot tours. Um, so I hope that after this, you can go in and you sign up for one of our robot tours. Uh, our first one is tomorrow. I'm a little nervous. I'm hoping the robot cooperates with us. Um, so I'm actually going to go into the building to make sure that I have to make sure the robot has a shirt. I have to make sure the shirt doesn't touch the wheels. I have to make sure the robot is fully charged. Um, but it's, it's exciting. Um, and the idea behind it is that 
and this is for all the eighth graders who are listening in, like this, this is a really exciting time for you. Like thinking about high school and where you're gonna spend the next four years. And I'm sorry that you have to do this remotely. Um, but one of my favorite things was tours, you know, last year and our student ambassadors are great and they would walk you around the, the you know, the hallway and you get to see the lockers and like eighth graders just like, just beam once they see our lockers and our, um, art room and our dance room and you know it's just it's a it's a it's a nice time for you and I hope that you have that excitement even though you have to do this remotely but the idea behind the robot tour is that you can join us from home like you are now and what we'll do is um we'll share the screen where we can see what the robot is seeing and we have this incredible student who's our robot driver I don't know how to drive the robot. <laughs> so she drives the robot and you'll be able to see what the robot sees. So we'll stop in the dance room and we'll see the lockers and the music room. And I hope that's somewhat exciting to you as it is to me. <laughs> um, but please join us for our robot tours. We'll be adding some more um, if they fill up, but it, 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 there's plenty of room still there. Um, so on that note, I'll pass it along to our faculty. Um, if all of you can go ahead and introduce yourselves, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'll go in the order, I guess, that I see you here. So I have Jess, Hannah, John, so let me have it. Yeah, hi. So my name is Jess Vanskoy. I've been at BSEC, this is my fifth year now, but I've been in the DOE for about 15 years. I primarily teach history, so I'm teaching US history and I'm teaching our first college tier course this year uh, called Race and Power. I know, it's exciting. Um, it is lovely to see and e-meet all of you and I look forward to hearing from you or seeing you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hannah McFadden. Uh, this is my third, third and a half, third year um, working at BSEC. Um, I teach ninth grade algebra and geometry and I'm currently teaching a year one college algebra course. So all math for me this year, um, but I have taught 10th um, grade uh, chemistry and physics um, in the past. Um, and as Jess said, excited to kind of get to know everyone on this call and looking forward to hopefully seeing some of you in the building in 2021, 22. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Gerweiler. I am a, this is actually my 18th year teaching. Um, this is my fourth year at BSEC. And a fun fact, I am a Bard alum. Um, I currently, and have been for the past four years, have been co-teaching ninth grade lit. Uh, this year, I'm also co-teaching first year seminar with Isaac. Um, and I miss being in the building. Yeah, yeah. So um, so for the eighth graders, um, you know, this, I just want to echo what Olga said. This is a really important time, um, also a stressful one. And we at Beast Set Queens want to make it as easy and as uh, seamless for you as possible. If you're an eighth grader and you're afraid to ask a question, please don't ask the question. You should be emailing us, um, taking on responsibility for yourself. And any no question is uh, is too silly. Uh, if you want to know about clubs, we have information about that. If you want to know about um, you know class size, information about that. Um, so please, please ask as many questions as you feel you need to and you'd like. Hi everyone, my name is Salemia Gainza and it's actually my first year at Bard as a teacher. However, I attended BSEC Queens myself as a student. I graduated in 2011. Val was my principal, she's awesome. Um, it's my sixth year teaching in general, but it's my first year in high school. I previously taught eighth graders actually, so you guys uh, for five years and I know how incredible eighth graders are. I now teach 10th grade literature and history, and I'm really excited to be back at Bard. Um, I, I transferred into Bard. I went to another high school for ninth and 10th grade, and truly my experience at Bard was phenomenal. Obviously, I wouldn't have come back if it wasn't that special, but it was 
just incredible. It was truly the first time that I was excited about education. I was treated as an adult. I felt, you know, really respected and valued and like I mattered and BART is really a special place. So I hope that you're all able to join and, and come. So yeah, welcome. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so the next part of the program is just uh, kind of an explanation of what is what does special education look like at um, Bard Queens? Um, so I don't know who wants to start. Did you want me to start off with what most students take in the special ed program or? That's great. That would be great. Yeah. So um, predominantly um, students at our school are in ICT, right? And integrated co-teaching, meaning they have two teachers in the room and they get support from both teachers. Both, both teachers are, are teaching and also supporting. Um, and so that's predominantly where our focus is. We also offer, uh, I mean, because we're talking about individualized programs, we're going to see what our students come in with and then look at their IEPs and think about how we're going to structure what they need. And as they progress in the program, we also think about the supports that are helpful and the supports that maybe they're, um, they can get from going to office hours as opposed to having sets. So some of our sets, we have math sets, we have ELA sets. Um, and for ELA sets, predominantly what we do is um, help our struggling readers um, so, and that's, that's been a little bit of a shift in our program. Last year or this year, all of our incoming ninth graders or most of our incoming ninth graders, if it made sense for their programs are in an AIS class one day a week. And Jess can talk a little bit about this because I know she has one of these, these sections. I, or I think maybe she's the only one. And basically in that period, we talk about um, executive functioning skills. We talk about how to organize your planner. We talk about how to sign into your classes, um, how to ask for extra help, the things that a lot of people struggle with, but we have the added benefit of being able to support um, our students who come in with IEPs in ways um, that will help them transition from, I know that was one of the questions, help them transition from, from eighth grade um, with, that, with that added support. Um, and so, you know, there are other kinds of services. There's counseling, of course, you know, whatever's on the IP we provide, right? There's, there's counseling services, there's speech services, there's vision services, there's physical therapy. We have a student who has physical therapy. So we, they're all, whatever is in the IP, we, we obviously um, support um, within our program. So Jess, did you wanna talk a little bit about what you've been doing in AIS or? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. So we basically, as Lori said, we work on executive functioning. So um, with remote learning, it's a little bit more difficult. We have to break off and have individualized conversations just to kind of curate uh, for the students needs. But I, uh, we start off by making larger goals for the year. Sorry, my husband just got home and my dog is excited. Um, so we start off by making larger concrete goals, long term goals that we're hoping to reach. And then every time we meet on a weekly basis, we say, okay, what's a small short term goal that we can work on today or this week that's going to help us reach those long term goals. So we want to always kind of keep that long term thinking. Um, in the back of our heads while we're focusing on today because a lot of teenagers they think about the here and now and what I'm trying to do is get them to think way more in the future like either next year or four years or 10 years um, and so the future is always in the back of our heads so that's one thing that we do is goal setting we will look at the week ahead of them look at their google classroom make sure that they're checking their email on a daily basis make sure that they're checking Google Classroom, make sure that they're checking pupil path and their grades and what scores they've been given and reaching out to teachers if they wanna, if they need to advocate for themselves. We will backwards plan if they have a large essay or a large project coming up, we'll say, okay, if this is due in two weeks, what are things, how can we chunk this in such a way so that we have bite-sized bite -size pieces every day rather than, oh no, this is due tomorrow. What am I gonna do? Let me do this all at once. Um, so those are kind of the different things that we talk through. And again, you know, especially with remote learning, I do a lot more social emotional work with them lately. 
Um, a, um, so basically talking through, playing little games, seeing that there is hope out there, making sure that kids are drinking enough water, making sure they're going outside and taking a walk, masks on. Um, but it's important for them to get up and get moving um, and really see that, you know, and get some fresh air and some vitamin D. Um, so those are kind of my, my what I touch upon. Um, and I hope that helps a little bit. One other thing I can say is that um, all of the um, student support teachers who are here, um, they have a caseload of students that they are responsible for making sure they, you know, they organize the IEP meeting, they pull in the gen ed teacher to, to come to the IEP meeting, they write the IEPs. So they each have a load of, I think right now it's 11 students, right? Is that is that accurate? I mean, we have 67 um, students who have IEPs in the school right now, which is bigger than it's ever been, um, which is very, very exciting. And as the program grows, we're able to even, you know, think more about how to how to support the students. So they each have a, have a caseload too, and they they make a lot of contact with families. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I can also talk about what it looks like, what school looks like when we're in the building. Um, I'm sure a lot of students are, and parents might be curious about what school looks like. So if you are a student IEP, um, as Lori um, just noted, we offer ICT. That means there are two teachers in the classroom. Um, and the way class runs um, at our school, uh, I'll talk about the humanities, uh, and I think Hannah can talk about math and sciences as well, but we sit like in a seminar. So we don't have, we don't sit like in a desk formation at our school. Um, what we do is we believe in this idea of constructing meaning together. And so we sit like in a circle um, and we talk about, at least in literature, we talk about books what's interesting to us and uh, this relates to uh, what we're seeing and noticing. Um, this connects to the um, quote that Val shared, shared earlier. Um, and my job as a um, special ed teacher is to be there in the classroom with everyone um, and at times to offer supports for students who might be having difficulty comprehending something. The, the, check, the, the texts are pretty challenging that we read. Um, so it's my job to help students um, as ways to make meaning of that. And we do that through a different, through lots of different ways. So I won't like bore you with those details. But um, but if you're wondering what class looks like, um, we we sit in a circle, well, kind of a squarish, not really a circle. Um, and we we talk a lot and we write a lot as well. We're always writing about our thoughts and response to, to reading. Um, and then we offer after school hours as well, homework help. And there's a really good time to meet with your teachers um, and to really sort of get that extra, extra support that you need um, if you aren't taking an AAS or SETS class. Hannah, do you wanna talk about math, what that looks like? Sure. So um, in math, definitely not much reading or writing. Um, we do not sit in a circle, but rather, um, in the ninth grade at least, uh, my co-teacher and I, David Price, um, we actually had a very um, stand up, move around the room approach. And so when we were in the building last year, um, the way we started class was we actually had whiteboards, about six or, yeah, that's five to six whiteboards, smaller, probably like this size. Um, and we had them all around the room. And so the beginning of class um, was spent the first probably 10 minutes, we called it, the opener to do now, um, where groups of students worked on a problem that we gave um, on the whiteboard. So if you walked into our classroom, you would see small groups of five students in, uh, separated working on the whiteboard um, collaboratively through, you know, working out that problem that we assigned. Um, then we would, you know, call time. We'd all sit back in smaller. Uh, so instead of sitting around a circle, we are sitting in group tables of about four or five students. Um, and we would review the opener together um, on the whiteboard um, or an app like a PowerPoint. Um, and then we typically would have a bit of a mini lesson. So um, generally that would be David Price, the general education teacher would give maybe a five minute or 10 minute 
overview of the topic that we'd be going over to the, um, that day. Um, and then students would work in their small groups on whatever activity um, we had in store for them. And so in math, we really try to promote um, student voice. And so we focused on the students kind of trying to figure out ways and different approaches to solve the problems we um, we assigned. And so as a special education teacher, um, my job kind of during that um, work time was really just circulating throughout the room as much as I could, along with David, my co-teacher, just, you know, um, being there to support the students learning, asking any questions. Um, and we also last year set up um, a help desk. So it was an empty desk uh, that any student in the room, if they were feeling really stuck and they felt like, you know, maybe my group is moving too fast or I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. I could kind of use a one on one. Um, they would just go to the help desk and David and I would notice and we'd go over and kind of offer some one to one support. Um, so, yeah, that was a, that was a lot. But um, off the top of my head, that's kind of the nature of the ninth grade math classes. Uh, 10th grade college, um, still we used group, we, we still have group work, um, but I would say that that is more, um, a little more time sitting down, listening to the instruction, working on problems, but of course um, the supports are all there. Um, I'll leave it at that. I feel like I've said enough, so. <laughs> Can I just add to what John was saying in the humanities, as a history teacher, we utilize different groups and group sizes. So we work a lot. We notice that a lot of notice. We know that a lot of students are very shy and they may, may struggle to share in a larger group. So very much like math, and I'm sure John does this as well in, in literature, we will separate kids into different smaller groups, have them share out their ideas together, and then come back as a larger group. And hopefully they feel a little bit more confidence um, that their thoughts were heard and validated, and then they're able to share in a large group. And sometimes we do that heterogeneously. We, off, we definitely prioritize um, heterogeneous groups at our school. We know that students, all students can learn from each other, whether they're you know, struggling readers or whatnot, they can absolutely, they have ideas and opinions that have value and we want them to share out with each other. Um, but we also sometimes might use more homogenous groupings. Um, so sometimes I might take my struggling readers into a homogenous group if I know that that text is particularly hard for that day and then we'll read it out loud together and we're gonna stop and we're gonna visualize and we're gonna look up words together and we're gonna learn that vocabulary so that we can build that reading stamina. Um, and so we strategize different types of groups um, in that way as well. Yeah. We do that as well in lit, yes, yeah, yeah. So do your IC classes go through 12th grade? Yes, they do. Well, year one, year two. Mm -hmm. How about your- Yeah, this, I'll, I'll <laughs> emphasize the, the way our program uh, is structured is that students enter in ninth grade, they do 10th grade, and then they enter the college program, mm -hmm. which we call year one and year two. Um, which are typically 11th and 12th grade. But in year one and year two, students are taking um, college level courses. So the ICT classes do go through all four years. And that's part of our tiered program that Lori was talking about. We're really excited about that. I think there's nowhere else in America where you can sit in on college courses and have that kind of support that you would need. And so this is really a novel thing that we're offering to have college for two years with ICT support, um, two teachers in a room. Um, and so it's ha like all of our students, you enter college early, but the option of either doing it as you progress through the four years, maybe you think, oh, I'm good for literature and I'm gonna take that as in a general ed way. I'm not gonna have, I don't need additional supports at this point anymore, but in my, in my social studies, I do. So I'm gonna to wanna to do that. And so there's discussions with families after 10th grade, that last semester of 10th grade, as we think about what are your strengths, where have you grown, and how are you going to, to grow next year and what's the best supports for you there? And if they include ICT, then there's ICT. And at whatever, lev whatever tier you're taking that class, you are still exposed to a college class. Right, and so 
when you move on to your next college, you've been in that college class and you've built those skills. Even if you're, take, if you're taking it at a tier three, you're getting the high school credit, but you're also earning the ability to know what it's like to be in a college class. Um, and you, you, you take that with you. So there are two right. questions in the chat, one from Matt. Yeah, I just, I just mentioned, we, we, we can answer those in the Q&A um, section. So I, I just wrote them down and I'll, I'll make sure to come back to Mark and Matthew's question. Um, but I wanted to move on. We, we do have some amazing current parents and some really amazing current students. Um, so if I could have the current parents maybe just um, introduce yourself and um, let us know what year your, your child, your person is in, um, and whatever else you, you wanted to, to add, maybe, um, a resource that you found to be, um, specifically helpful for your, for your student or anything else that you wanted to add. So, um, let's see who's first online. Michelle? Mimi, do you want to go first? And then I have Jen next. Sure. Um, yeah, I can't change my name, but I'm Mimi. Um, and my son is Arlo. He's a little further down in the, one of the squares. And um, uh, he's a freshman, so he's in ninth grade. Um, and uh, Bard Queens was his first choice. It was really amazing when he got in, um, but we were terrified. <laughs> to be honest, because, you know, it's, it's an incredibly rigorous and um, intellectually challenging place. Um, and I know that he can do the work. And he's plenty smart. Um, everybody's kids are super smart and can do this. But I just wasn't sure um, about all the moving parts, you know, for having um, so many challenging classes. And then on top of that, the remote learning piece. Um, and what I've found is that um, everybody's, everybody's stepped up, everybody, you know, my kids stepped up, the teachers stepped up, the, um, uh, at all the, all the people that he leaned on, including senior students and, uh, his peers. I mean, everybody is, is in it together, which is really, it's an amazing community. That's, that's what I would say. Um, and then as far as his learning, I mean, I feel like it, his learning curve is just so steep. Um, he's really um, grown so much um, in just even the past semester. I'm I'm astonished and and grateful um, to Bard for for all the scaffolding that they do and all the support and how accessible um, the teachers are for him. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, Jen, do you want to? say a few words. Um, hi, my name is Jen. I have a year one student at Bard, Queens. Um, you know, I think uh, I could quickly say from just the people that spoke here today, Jessica, um, you know, all, all, a lot of the teachers, you know, they're wonderful, but they all have these individual strengths that they share with each other. And I'm just gonna embarrass some people today. So you hope you don't mind, but Jessica, Jessica knows how to make things accessible. And this is, I mean, I truly learned what accessibility means when, when you work with Jessica Van Scoy, because she literally takes, because you know, with social studies, I'm sure a lot of students understand when you're re reading social studies stuff, it's like, Cop, you know, photocopy 10 times over and it's like grainy and you're like, oh my God, I can't read this. And she takes that all and she transfers it all into Google Docs and then she puts them in a folder for each unit. And so you can find them. So you don't have to, if you lose your paper, it doesn't matter because it's in Google anyway. And you know where you're gonna see it. Um, so, you know, and that's really great. Like I actually teach assistive technology and I use her materials when I teach because it's that good. Um, uh, you know, on top of that, she has, I didn't learn this until later, but she has this really cool thing where she watches all the students and she sees them participate and she checks it. It's like, there's like a graph where she checks it. And I didn't know that, but the students know. As long as the students know, I think that's really wonderful. John Grauweiler, what he does is he has like this toolbox. If it was like an X little tools, then he'd have like this massive giant toolbox of tools. And he gives all the students, here's this tool, here's that tool, here's this tool. 
we just picked one tool that he had. It was so great. We pinned it up on her our wall. He used it and my student, my son memorized it. He uses it. I shared it with other parents. They love it. It's a great tool of how to like transition with when you're using um, examples and details to, to support your argument. Um, he also does this straight talk thing where it's just like, listen, you know, you owe me this, 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 and this. And it's really helpful to the student because it's it's like, um, it's not shameful. It's like, it's just straight talk. And, you know, it's concrete. And students who need that concrete um, detailed assistance, they get it, you know? And so it's not like this gray area, like I'm terrible. It's like, I just need to do these things to get to my next track and, and I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And it's really helpful. Hannah, you know, um, if somebody had energy, <laughs> like this person has so much energy. If if you had like a glass of water, she would, uh, you know, turn it upside down to the very last drop so that she would give everyone everything she's got. She has that much energy. She will go after students and say, but I can teach you more, you know, <laughs> and I can do help you more. And so these are the, I don't know Salemia, but we will get to know you. Um, you know, the last thing I just want to tell parents here that I think is probably the most important thing I can tell you as a parent is that you want your child who has different abilities, a different background from others to be able to go to a place where they feel like they're included. Um, you want a place that lets them know that they're valued. Um, this is a school that values people from everywhere. Um, and so it's not like you're so special. It's like you are you and you're, you belong here. And um, you know you don't have to have a certain criteria to be here. It's just you belong here. And I think you know um, as students with disabilities, you you know you're going to face challenges for the rest of your life in many different ways. And so you want to be in a place where they're going to they're going to help you cultivate that because it's not like someone tells you you're fine, you're just different. No, no, no. It's you have to like learn how that works for you and how you can be in this world as yourself. And this is a school that could that could teach you how to become that in on your own way. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Jen, for your kind words. <laughs> um, all right, so. Do we have any other parents on? I just wanted to make sure. Okay, um, I don't think so. So let's move on to our students. If any other parents join us, then I'll bring it back around. Um, so the first one on my screen is Edwin. Edwin, do you wanna go first and just uh, say your name and, um, maybe what middle school you came from and what grade you're in uh yeah sure uh my name is Adon Sibura. i came from uh leonardo da vinci i61 i'm not sure if some of you are coming from there uh and i'm currently a year one this is like my third year in bard so far so <laughs> yeah i mean it's a nice school so <laughs> you guys should yeah, come here Great, thank you, Edwin, so much. Um, so the next one I have is Logan. Hi, my name is Logan, and this school, I might perceive it differently than others because uh, basically based on my personality, either that one about how everyone learns and how everyone goes along, they just see like no matter what disability you have, they, my way of thinking there's either two ways. One, they understand, or two, they don't care because they have a lot of homework. So, what? So I I hope it I hope it's the first way. But, um, everyone is generally nice. Some students have do ha understand that, well, Jenna students technically got the idea, but not quite of disorders, but it's nice that they do. And there's, I'm pretty sure they mentioned before office hours. I did have a teacher that went out of their way and 
help 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 me in math at 8 a.m at 8 8 a.m be like way before school starts so that that was useful so they're pretty much always on top of you to make sure you do well so that's essentially what i t took away and yeah it's difficult school kill me did you want to say your middle school and what year you are oh uh, yes i'm a year one and i came from q300 and well i was basically in two middle schools but i'm not going to get into the second one because i hate it thank you so much logan um so the next student i have is arlo um hi i'm arlo i went to um center school ms243 and i'm currently in ninth grade and i it's pretty fun here all of the teachers are really nice they're not going to get that mad at you just make sure you do your homework and stuff and like they'll stay chill and stuff but yeah it's pretty fun thank you arlo all right the next one i have is francesca Hey, um, I'm Francesca. I went to Brooklyn School of Inquiry. So I think that's uh, 686. Um, and I'm year two, which means unfortunately I'm in my last year here. I can't believe that Francesca. <laughs> I don't wanna believe that. Um, so the next one is Maya. Hi everyone, my name is Maya. Um, I'm also a year two. Um, which is really sad, but um, okay. So I went to New Voices Middle School in South Slope. I think it was MS443. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly though. Um, and oh yeah, I already said I'm a year two. Great, thank you to all the students. Um, so the next part of our um, program is just questions and answers. I know a lot of you submitted some questions um, online. So I'm going to just read some um, and ask our faculty and students and parents, whoever wants to answer, um, feel free, um, you know, to answer. So the first one is, uh, do students do group work or collaborative classwork? And if you can speak a little bit about homework. Maybe that's a good one for some of our students. Maybe I could imagine a year two and, and a ninth grader taking that to hear what your experiences are. Uh, I'll take a year, can you take oh, a year one? year one, yeah. <laughs> well, homework is very difficult. Um, I could definitely say not only for special ed, but including gen ed, but in total, it's gonna be very difficult. Their homework policy or, ac or academic policy is very, very strict. So it's generally difficult. So just do your homework and you'll be fine. Any other students maybe to talk about, like, is there an emphasis on group and collaborative work? Is it more individual? Um, what's your take on that? Um, well, I, I know that at least for me, um, my school, I, I mean, my, as a ninth grader, the homework is mainly independent, although like the teachers will like say you can like co collaborate with other people if you need help, but like you shouldn't use them for answers and stuff. Um, but it generally takes me like two or three hours, um, including over the weekends. So it's pretty, I'd say it's pretty light because All right, thank you so much, Arlo. Um, the next question oh, actually, uh, is- Can we talk uh, about homework for a second? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. sorry I'll, I'll be quick. Um, yes, um, I think we, uh, the, the reputation is that uh, Visa, Queens, and Manhattan, um, you know, uh, give a lot of homework. And, and that's true. I think on average, every night, um, there are two, three hours um, you know, of homework every night, and that's, that's a lot. Uh, but um, because we are thinking and we're here today um, thinking about how we support students um, with IEPs and how to deal with that, we um, really are, the team is really focused on from the first day, even through the very last day, 
of helping students um, perfect their executive functioning skills. And so setting up schedules with them so that they actually can meet um, the requirements and deadlines, so they're not feeling overwhelmed. And so, yes, there is lots of homework here. It is a rigorous school and, and um, there's no way around that. Uh, but, um, but we don't just throw homework at students and say, fend for yourself. Um, we actually develop a plan um, with them. Uh, so what is your nightly homework? Um, what does it look like on a Monday, a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? You know, that's sort of, that's part of the, um, and, uh, and so just, just know, know that. Um, and, you know, the, the next four years between ninth and, and 12th grade or year one, year two um, are pivotal. And these are years where we come into being and we sort of take ownership of our lives. And so we try and you know, balance this where we give students their, you know, autonomy, but at the same time, we have training wheels for them. And so by the time they leave us, you know, um, they have, they know how to create a schedule for themselves and how to prioritize um, and to meet, meet deadlines. Um, I think that's, a, that's important to share. I want to just piggyback on that response, John, because the next question asked about, um, our accommodations provided to special ed students in regards to the, to the amount of workload required? Example, extended homework time. Can I take a stab at that, that question? Just my, my first um, way of, of addressing that would be, we talk to teachers a lot about the objective of an assignment, right? Like, so if you get a homework assignment that has a lot of problems on it. Let's say it's a math assignment. There, there are a lot of problems on. I think the teachers think about um, the idea of mastery versus the idea of doing a lot of problems. So we talk, we talk about um, how do we show mastery as opposed to, you know, doing, doing more and more and more, right? Like how can we, um, how can we help our students? Because we don't want to reduce the, the work that they're doing and the, the ways that they're learning because we want them to be in college as year one students. So we want to make sure that we're supporting them, but also making sure that we have the rigor for them. So I think the idea of what, what ultimately do you want to achieve and how can you achieve that while also not overwhelming you with the amount of work, right? Does that, does that make sense? I also want to add to that and just say that for students who need those assignments modified, sometimes we might chunk the reading, we might define the words for them and have that available for them. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, other strategies like uh, we definitely allow extensions, but kind of what Lori and John were talking about, sometimes those extensions um, can get just as overwhelming as the assignment because you have other work coming in as you're trying to finish up this other um, larger project or, or quiz or test. And so what we try and prioritize is setting goals with students. Okay, how long is it going to take you to do this assignment past its due date? Then we meet when that time is due. And if they are able to turn that paper or project in, terrific, you met that goal. If not, we have to really reassess and talk about what is kind of preventing them from finishing it. So it really is individualized. It's through conversations, getting to know your child and figuring out what their strengths are and utilizing those strengths wherever we can when we're working on assignments like this. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just moving along. Um, how is sets done at our school? Do you, I can, yeah. I can, yeah. or Hannah, do you want to do that as a, well, when students come into the school in general, their IEPs either, and this is just what, from what the IEPs that I've seen, they either have ICT or sets on them. Some people have both, but most people have one or the other. Um, and so in general, we don't, we don't necessarily add sets to an IEP, right? So if they have sets, then for us in general, um, it's, you know, to support reading and then in, in math. Um, but we do have sets and it meets, um, you know, however many times it, it calls for on the IEP. And it's, it's specific to the subject matter. 
So there isn't any sort of general sets. The sets is either ELA sets or math sets. So. Yeah, and so I, I, sorry, I can speak a little to that. I haven't taught, I haven't taught sets. I don't teach it this year and I didn't teach it uh, last spring either, but I know um, my first year or second year I taught math sets and um, usually what we'd do is we'd start the period um, kind of just looking at the looking at the week at a glance so you know are they are in, are there upcoming quizzes are there any upcoming exams um it is pull it is pull out well no we don't pull out so we just have a specific period built into their schedule where they have sets um does anyone want to correct me if i'm wrong on that sorry i saw facial expressions yeah so we don't yeah we don't go into the room and pull them out um and we don't really push in when we're in the room it's just ict and they have that built-in support there um and so during the period we would just go over homework questions sometimes i would preview the material that was a support that many students benefited from um i think that it also provided this space where the students who were really shy or maybe they really struggled with asking a question um during class like we would kind of break it down, break down the concepts um, and review them. So that's what I did a little bit in math sets. Thank you. Um, so the next question asks, what assistance do you provide for executive function issues? Um, and what will the transition be like from middle school to high school, especially in light of the disruption of eighth grade due to COVID? Maybe um, we can have Arlo speak a little bit about that since he's our, our, our newest student to BSEC and um, he, he experienced that. So again, what assistance do you provide for executive function issues and um, what's that transition like from middle to high school? Uh, for me, the transition from middle to high school was kind of difficult, but it really helped in the DNA program because that was also um, completely remote and it was through Zoom. So it really helped me get a feel for like what it was talking about and like what the whole concept of BARD was. So I would really recommend doing that. And um, for the executive function, the, that what really helped was the, um, I have an AIS class with Marlon and he it really helps to have like, on every Friday, we just sit down um, and it's like 10 of us in a group and we all just talk about um, like how to, what we have coming ahead of us. And it's really easy for us. It's, well, it's easier for me to plan ahead using that strategy. I'll chime in and say that the, the, the DNA Fellows Program was super, super good for him. I mean, he, he actually struggled a lot in that program and really, he really like flailed, um, but it was a great way to sort of transition um, and that was sort of low stakes in a sense, right? Because um, it was just a chance to sort of feel what it was like, but there were only two or three classes. Um, there were, you know, he was able to form relationships with the teachers and really figure out where the holes were in his executive function and, and organization so that by the time he started real school and you know it was it's still a lot for him to organize himself but um you know like jen was saying he gets so many tools um from his teachers and that it i think he what's great to see is that he's become so independent and um a really great self-advocate for himself like he can sort of figure out what he needs and ask for it um which is amazing Thank you. Um, so the next question is, please explain the support services with regard to college course level work and the actual application to college. Is this about the tiers? Um, that is a follow-up question too. So uh, if you can explain the tiers uh, a bit more, I saw it on the chat as well. But I guess in, yeah, in reference to the tiers and then uh, maybe uh, one of us can speak about our, our CTO advisory system in general. Oh, so it's not about our college program. It's about college, our, the next college you're going to. It's actually about both. So please explain the support services with regard to the college course level work. 
Um, so I guess if, if those supports look different than they um, do like from our high school program and what support for the application to college. I feel like I'm talking a lot. Does anyone else want to talk about the tiers? Um, I can if you want. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the program. And so um, the, there are three tiers that students can join. The third tier is um, a tier that looks very similar to what you would have experienced in our ninth and 10th grade. That um, the, you had those supports in ninth and 10th grade and those supports are working for you and you're not ready to remove any of those supports to go to a less restrictive environment. And so you continue with those supports um, and that could be two teachers in the room, it could be sets, it could be AIS, whatever supports are necessary for you as you continue um, in your education at our school. The interesting thing about that tier three is you're doing that in a class where you're sitting next to students who are in a college course. So you're, we have, um, in this case, modified some of the assessments so that they're, these are now typical high school assessments. I was just talking to our um, high school biology, uh, a college biology teacher, and she was talking to me about one of the students in her class who's taking that course as a high school student. And so she has a different assessment than for her college students than the student who's taking it and getting high school credit for that course. So that's tier three. Tier two is you're taking that course for college credit. You're taking the same assessments as everyone else who's in that course. Um, and we know that it's really helpful and beneficial for you to have a second teacher in the room. Maybe you need um, a tap on the shoulder. Maybe you need somebody to to help modif not to not to do a um, not a modification of the assignment, but um, to um, give you the assignment in a different way, and so that you see it differently. But um, you'd still be expected to do, say, the ten-page paper or whatever the assignments are. Um, and so then the third, the first tier, tier one, is actually you've had um, time to grow over the course of the first two years, and you actually don't need an ICT um, second teacher in that room anymore. So now you'll be in that course, just like everybody in the gen ed program, taking it for college credit. And so the courses that have three tiers in them, you can decide whether you wanna take your English class as a tier one or a tier two or a tier three and your social studies may be different from that and your science may be different from that. So you choose which tier you'd like in each of the disciplines. And you do that as, with a committee of people who know you. So that's, I mean, that's another really special part of this is that as you choose that, you get an opportunity as a student to sit down with your parents who know you and your teachers who know you and your case manager and an administrator and a guidance counselor. And it's a meeting about you and who you are moving forward, what your goals are, what you'd like to see as growth moving forward. And you select your um, tiered courses in that first year of college as you leave your 10th grade. And then you have opportunities to shift those tiers as you move out, move through the college program. So that's that program. And then um, the college transfer program, um, that's an advisory program that we offer that um, Francesca and Maya have both lived through. Um, they're, they're just finishing it up now. And so maybe I'll pass that to them to describe their experiences and what support they've had for applying to colleges. Both of them have just finished their application process, I think. Um, sure, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, yeah, it's um, kind of in the thick of college application seasons, kind of finishing them up now. Um, so the CTO, the college transfer office, um, basically what happens is in year one, in like the second semester, what happens is that every advisory, which is usually a little under like 15 to 20 students, um, each advisory gets given a um, CTO faculty member. So a faculty member who has been, basically been trained in order to like help students guide their way through um, the college process. And 
CTO advisory every week, which is just going to be the same period you would have your normal advisory period. Um, they'll basically give you lessons and they teach you about different facets of the college application process, depending on kind of where you are. So at the start, it's a lot more about, you know, finding different colleges and filling up your list. And more recently, it's been about, um, you know, figuring out how to read financial aid awards and those kinds of things. And that's a really, that's been a really helpful resource. I know for me, I've had a few meetings with my um, college CTO counselor. Um, and that's really great because you can kind of get to be with your advisory, which is people you're familiar with and have kind of a more personal and direct connection. Um, and so I might, you know, if I'm like writing out an essay that I'm going to send to a certain school, I might like email my CTO counselor and be like, hey, Chris, could you um, meet with me and like give me some feedback on this essay? Um, and that's great and that's super accessible. Um, and so you kind of have that support throughout the college application process. Maya, do you have anything to add? Um, I don't know. I think Francesca, you did a really good job um, talking about it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really actually think that I would add anything. Thank you. And just to clarify, I mean, the office is called the College Transfer Office um, because our students graduate with an associate's degree um, and many of them are thinking about transferring those credits. So um, that's, that's what it's called, the CTO office. And we have a CTO director who helps facilitate that process. Um, so I just, I'm sorry, yeah. Olga, can I just yeah. add that the CTO, our new CTO officer mm -hmm. is very interested in um, how to transfer students who do have IEPs and how that IEP or 504 transfers over to the next school that they go to. So when you get to that point, um, that's that's her thing, like that's her jam. She's very interested in in that transition. So she's gonna be a really great resource when when we get there. So, sorry, Olga. That's a great point. Thank you for adding that. Um, so just moving along, uh, we have some questions specifically about how we support autistic students um, and how are neurotypical kids encouraged to engage with them. Is that for us? Okay. All right, so what, what are the specific skills that we use? Is, is that the question to support students with autism? Um, we actually have a, um, a as, as Jen noted, um, a uh, sort of pretty big toolbox um, to, support, to support students with autism. Um, I find personally the students that um, have been diagnosed with autism, that the in the classroom, so there needs to be very clear um, supports for them. Um, sometimes it there is um, maybe it requires different seating, maybe the the lights are off, or maybe there's sort of um, other issues that are happening too. We're reading too quickly, but it really requires meeting with the student beginning of the year, finding out what it is that makes um, this also reading the IP. Um, that might create anxiety tension for the student and creating an environment that's gonna be work for them in the classroom. Um, so it's not like a one size fits all, but it's really this, this work happens at the beginning of the year, reading the IP, meeting with the students, and then meeting with the co-teacher um, and developing a plan of action. Some students don't like sitting in a, pardon me, in a group setting so they so we have to know that you can't force a kid into a group setting if that's going to make them you know anxious right and be resistant to learning so um so we have like lots of things that we do but it all starts with meeting uh, reading ip meeting um students and uh co-teachers and developing a plan yeah, and to add to that, so as John mentioned, very like clear, explicit instructions. Um, a big thing is also um, creating uh, routines and sticking to them. So especially for our incoming ninth graders this year, I mean, the remote world is difficult enough, but we've uh, tr tried our best to really design 
a pretty strict w- weekly schedule. Um, and when, you know, for instance, something comes up that will change that schedule, for instance, you know, the holiday. So a short work week, for example, Thanksgiving, we had to put a little shift. So we do our best to make sure that we're telling students um, about that change in advance um, and kind of putting everything that we put, um, everything that we say out loud. We always have those reminders on Google Classroom. So that's just another one I thought of. But as John said, the toolbox is wide and it's very, depends on the kid. And so we, we do our best to get to know them very uh, individually and support them. Yeah, I just want to add as a history teacher, just to agree with what Hannah was saying, I like to prime them if we're about to learn something that might be very difficult. Um, I also think that we make ourselves available a lot for students who might have a lot of questions or might worry about things. Um, As far as interacting with peers, um, we do not spotlight the uh, disability, we spotlight the child and we make sure that they shine Um, And that even though they might have certain quirks, they still have value and they're still adding to the conversation. Um, And so if that tends to go awry, we will have explicit conversations with students. Um, And then I'll also have an explicit conversation with the child who's on the spectrum and talk about how do we deal with students who might not understand where you're coming from and how Um, what might be the consequences of behaving one way versus another. So being able to have those conversations, be it in breakout rooms and remote learning, which I use a lot, um, or private chat, um, or just in person learning, I might pull somebody to the side and have that conversation. Or I might say, hey, I'd like you to stop by my office. So I think making ourselves accessible um, is one of our, the main toolbox that we, or the main tool that we use in our box. And just hearing that, I remember that thinking about group counseling too as a way that some of our students um, benefit who have autism. Supporting that connection and building connections and learning how to do those conversations. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning of BSEC Manhattan, um, when it first started, I think the BSECs have always attracted um, students somewhere on the spectrum. And when I was at BSEC Manhattan, um, there it was, it was, um, you know, Asperger's. And so I think that it is the kind of place that supports students as individuals. And I think that we have attracted a lot of students on the spectrum, but it's a spectrum, right? So I think that it's really hard to say, you know, um, that students will react in the same way. So again, an environment that really gets to know students individually will be a place where we can we can then work with students one on one. And like I said, uh, you know, when I first introduced myself, the team is really phenomenal. Like they want to figure this out. And so I think it's there is no just one magic way. And you know, as the mother of an autistic daughter she changes all the time too. So the things that that she has to adjust to change, right? So there isn't just one thing that we would do. It's a constant conversation about um, about the needs. And I think that that's, that's why our students feel so supported. So. Olga, um, I wanted to add there that um, uh, I think some of the challenges of autism, uh, you know, when it's social, you know, it happens in the hallway, it happens in the classroom, it's not necessarily in a conversation with a teacher, but it's also about conversations between, between students to other students. Um, and just, you know, the hallway culture and all of that, you know, what I glean from my family is that um, I don't think that it's confusing to be at Bard. You know, I don't, I think that um, students kind of understand what's expected of them, like what's expected behavior, like a, what's, I also think that Students are rather well behaved at bar for the most part. And I think that students who um, have emotional challenges like being in a calm place where people kind of have an understanding of each other and a respect uh, for each other. Um, You know, I do feel that, you know, uh, group work for students on the spectrum is really difficult. And so, you know, um, parents and students can work with teachers to make that process um, 
more accessible. Uh, but you know, overall, the nice part about um, being a, in a part of a community is that I don't think it's difficult to be in a part of the Bard community as a student on the spectrum. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just move on to maybe some of uh, uh, questions for our students about uh, extracurricular activities. Um, so what kind of clubs are, are there? Um, what kind of music offerings, um, theater performance opportunities and music or drama? Any of you want to take a stab at that? Oh, I'm sorry. And I also shared a document just now. Um, I know some of you are asking about which colleges accept credit. So this is a document that we put together um, uh, on colleges, four-year institutions granting early degrees to our alumni. So bachelor's degree within three years and then bachelor's degree within um, two years. But I will emphasize that it's it's driven by student choice. Uh, some of our, some students come into be second say, I'm gonna transfer every single credit. And then at the end of four years, they're like, no, you know, let me, I, I wanna spend four years um, away from home in California or something. So it, it, it's really student driven and, and what the student wants. Um, we realize that it's, it's um, you know, they save a lot of money if they uh, transfer credits. And that's really important for some of our students, our low income students, our undocumented students for whatever reason. Um, so our college transfer office will work with them specifically in looking at universities and colleges that accept the credits. Um, but our students go everywhere. Um, they go out of the country, they go across country, or they stay in Queens, you know? So um, that's just a list of uh, early graduation. So- Hold on, can I just you. add a bit yeah. to that? Sorry. Um, so like I said, I did graduate from BSEC Queens. Um, my, I went to Elon University, which is in North Carolina, and they took every single one of my credits. My CTO advisor helped me get a really incredible scholarship, and I was lucky enough to have been be able to stay all four years without having a financial hardship. And coming in with the 60 credits was truly amazing. I got first pick on dorms because I was able to go in with like the junior ranking. So I chose two years before everyone else. That also came in handy for classes. I was able to sign up for classes two whole days before everyone else, before the freshmen and the sophomores. And I was able to study abroad twice because I was able to, I came in knowing my major, I knew I wanted to study psychology. So I was able to quickly take in a lot of the major courses that I needed for that degree. And I kind of ran through those pretty quickly. So by the time I got to junior and senior year, um, I really just had a lot of electives, a couple final courses, but yeah, I ended up studying abroad for two full semesters and I got to take lots of really interesting electives, more electives than anyone should probably ever take, but it was really awesome. I, I took dance classes, I took golf, I took a theater makeup class. Um, so it gave me a lot of flexibility and it really was just awesome. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that you can do a lot with the 60 credits. And if you ever wanna talk any of the year twos or year ones here, if you wanna talk to me about that, I, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So you can email me. Thanks, Olivia. Um any of the students want to talk about extracurricular, theater, music, uh, performance opportunities? I can talk a little bit about clubs. Um, I personally am involved with a little bit, most of my extracurriculars are outside of BSEC, um, but I'm involved with the Girls Who Code Club, um, so you can speak to me more about that if you're interested. Um, but we also have a few performance clubs like the K-pop dance group, um, I think other people, other students can jump in also if you know some more that I don't. Um, but I know that we have certain ones for like certain professions, like future medical leaders. Um, and we also have a few cultural clubs like South Asian Student Association um, and that type of thing. They're more on the website also. Um, what about sports? Can any of you speak on sports? I meant to include that as well. Um, I can speak a little bit to it. I'm not 
currently involved in sports, but one of my um, good friends is like kind of one of the student masterminds behind all of the sports going on. So I have kind of the inside scoop. Um, so there are, we're in like the public school athletic league and there's, we have a shared campus with a couple of other high schools. And so we share sports teams or most of our sports teams with those schools. Um, and so students who are on those teams will go, there's like a YMCA nearby or there's some parks and they can practice. Um, and that's really cool to kind of like get a chance to get to know kids who you might never even see. Um, in terms of club sports, I think there's a few. Um, I don't know all of them. I'm pretty sure there's like a ping pong club, for example, but I might be totally making that up. Um, just an extra thing about clubs also, which is really cool, is that if you can get, I believe it's 10 students and a faculty sponsor, if you want, you can start your own club, um, which means that there's a ton of clubs and they kind of change every year. Um, but every year there's kind of a club fair and you can go and it's like crazy and everyone's like, come sign up and all of that. It's a very fun like yearly thing every September. Thank you. Yeah. So I know it's oh. 7.30 now and I wanna respect everyone's time. I can stay on for a bit longer than anyone else who wants to join, feel free to stay on with me, but um, I wanna respect your time. And um, you know, if you have any further questions and you need to leave, feel free to email me. I'll, I'll put my email in the chat, but you, sh you should have it from the email I sent earlier um, today. Um, but thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we can take some additional questions for those of you that can stick around, but no pressure to our faculty, our students, our parents. Thank you so much for helping tonight. Um, but if you need to leave, feel free. Well, can I share the, um, about a club as well, which I'm very excited about, the newest club on campus, and that is the Able Disabled Alliance, uh, which I'm the advisor for. Um, so, and the, this club was um, founded by Amy Weitzman, um, one of our students with disabilities. Um, and uh, Amy recognized that there wasn't a space, there had not been a space or a voice for students with disabilities of all, all types to uh, come together and to advocate um, for themselves. And so, um, and then also to work towards um, creating awareness within, this, within the school. Uh, and so now we have um, our first uh, um, club, the Able Disabled Alliance. It's an inclusive club, um, and it's you know it's it's pretty exciting um, space. And we are going to be bringing, uh, or rather, we'll be bringing um, speakers in and providing opportunities for the community to learn more about disability um, in uh, sort of in, in all facets. Um, and disability, so it falls under the dis rubric of disability rights. So we are, are officially um, embarking on a disability rights um, advocacy uh, campaign. <laughs> and I, I just received an email from that campaign where they wanted to invite Judith, um, I think you pronounce it human, it's H-E-U-M-A-N-N -N to speak. She is an advocate for disability rights across the country. Um, and I hope she does come and speak at our school. I also want to mention, um, and, and I also think there's room for growth. So um, when the, this group came in and said, look, there's more we can do at our school to recognize um, ability and disability, um, I was thrilled to hear about the speaker and hope that we can have her come. Um, I also noted that our, just as a cheer and a shout out to our librarian, Jess Hines, she just got funding to bring in James Tate Hill, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina, um, who wrote a book called Blind Man's Bluff. Um, it's a memoir of, about going blind and um, the experience of um, being the, the role of dis disability in identity. So how I identify personally with a disability. So I'm looking forward to hearing from that author and um, seeing the growth in, uh, in recognition of abilities across the school over time. That's been really rewarding for the last five years and there's more to do. So thank you everyone. I'm gonna head out. Thanks, Val. Yep, bye -bye. Um, thank
thank you everyone for, for joining us again, you know, feel free to email me any uh, questions we didn't get to or anything that comes up later. Feel free to join us on our robot tours. The one tomorrow is full, but we have some additional ones and we'll be adding um, the robot later. I wasn't able to incorporate the robot into this session because um, someone has to be in the building to turn the robot on. Um, so, and our building is closed at this time. So oh, yeah. thank you, everyone. Uh, oh, Jen, if any parent can. wants to speak to me individually, you can call Olga and she could, um, and Mimi too. <laughs> Mimi's nodding. So yeah, you. we have a group of parents that talk with each other from Bard, Queens and Manhattan. It's a, We have our own listserv. So we're together. So if anybody wants to speak to us, you could ask Olga and she'll connect you to us. That's right. It's a great community, the special ed, um, you know, group and and you know we we chat about everything from education to social to you know um just strategies um and it's it's a really really nice community thank you both for offering that and thank you to our students who stayed on so late and i know you have tons of homework and stuff for tomorrow so and thank you uh to our faculty and Lori so much so have a great night everyone and thank Bye. you, Olga. Thank you to you, Olga. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Olga. Thank you. Your work's appreciated. <laughs>